one day I finally flipped out and I punched my mother. My father came home from work and he took me to the local mental health clinic and I was seen by a psychiatrist there and that's how it started. When I went to college I became uh, fully manic and there were complaints about my behavior and the powers that be at the college referred me to a psychologist in town and the psychologist made the diagnosis of mania. I wasn't diagnosed with schizophrenia yet and I was psychotic and I, I thought World War III is breaking out in East Hampton. I, I had been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder in, in uh, 2000. Some, some of these issues went back to from when I was a teenager. Mental illness is really not one thing, or not one illness. Um, it's sort of, in my mind, it's sort of like the analogy would be if we, if we called all physical illnesses one thing, um, and we lumped, you know, heart disease and cancer and every other kind of, uh, you know, infection into, into one, one thing, and we said somebody has physical illness. Um, and when we say mental illness, um, it means many, many different kinds of illnesses. So when your friend is sick, you want to do something you can do for them. I mean, it's so hard, you know, it's an, I can't. Like if she had a broken leg, you know, she can set it and it will heal and you can see it and you can see it healing. But like a mental illness, it's like permeates your emotions and your mind and how you feel and what you see and what you think. And, you know, I wish it were just a broken leg, you know. <laughs> Someone might have uh, some pretty unusual behaviors that result from just an event, a traumatic event that happens, and it could be a very temporary situation. Someone can lose a spouse, or they can uh, they can ha get diagnosed with a physical illness and become extremely depressed or anxious or develop all kinds of symptoms which are temporary and which are not um, really the result of an underlying um, long-term illness. Or someone can be born with uh, predisposition to um, depression or other kinds of, of illnesses or schizophrenia, which are uh, much more serious illnesses. I was in college and um, I was typing, I was trying to type my essay and the voices told, well, a voice told me I was stupid. I started yelling at them in my class. What we need to do is to help people understand that it's nobody's fault. It's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's not anyone's fault. This is just, one of, again, one of those illnesses that people are afflicted by, and let's deal with it. Let's figure out how to best help the individual. When I was 14, my parents noticed something was wrong with me. I don't really know the details. All I know is um, apparently there was something wrong. I think it was probably a mood swing. When I reached high school, 10th and 11th and 12th grade, I started having regular mood swings that kind of went with the seasons. When winter came, I started getting depressed. And when spring came, I came out of the depressions. I wasn't medicated during that time. I wasn't uh, diagnosed. Growing up, I'm, I'm 13 years older than Chris, so I watched him as a young child, and he, in a lot of ways, was, was a typical, rambunctious, normal child. And in other ways, um, he had um, symptoms of what, you know, we've, we've come to know as uh, autism type symptoms. It was a nightmare. My mother was really too young to have a child when she did. And she was 
very cruel to me. And then I became nervous and fretful. And that irritated my father, and he began getting on me too. So I was, I was pretty far gone by the time I entered high school. From what I know now, I realized that I was schizophrenic as a teenager. Yeah, yeah. Beck has a traumatic past. Uh, Traumatized, yeah. Yeah, so it comes up sometimes. It's, it's, it's a hard thing. You can't tell the difference between reality and not reality. It's almost like you're in a fog. Your brain is in a fog. There were a fair amount of objections to my behavior and I had a hard time understanding why all of that was happening. Um, I was doing things that seemed natural to me and seemed reasonable to me and people were getting upset. I got a little bit of help when I was 19 and I was hospitalized when I was 20. When I was 20, I did four months in Westboro State Hospital. And then I got out, went back to college, graduated, got a BA. I was pre-law. My ma major was political science. Graduated from college, went to work for the telephone company. Worked for the telephone company for four years. Wasn't able to keep it up. My work just wasn't, my output wasn't good enough. I couldn't concentrate. I ended up on the streets for seven or eight years. And then landed in Northampton State Hospital. I had a bad nervous breakdown in 2002, so I was brought over here to the Pioneer Valley by my brother and, and uh, sister-in-law, whom I lived with for that summer as I was recovering. You know, Chris, Chris toughed it out, and um, one of his great qualities is he's, he's, he's extremely tough and strong, and, and so he, he sort of forged his way through life with this um, major disability, and uh, it wasn't easy. He um, often uh, ended up in um, homeless shelters, and found it difficult to live on his own. But I think over time, the strain of doing that caught up to him. Three, four years ago, I was at work and I got a call from a woman in uh, New York State who was his landlord at the time, and she said, you know, you got to come and get your brother because um, he's here uh, and a police officer is looking after him because we're very worried about him. The individuals that come to us are all referred by the Department of Mental Health, our funder. But I get many calls. In the course of a week, I may take one or two calls from a family who is just beside themselves about a family member, a son or a daughter or a, someone in their family who is, is in need of, of services and where do they turn? He was in a terrible state of mind and we took him, the only thing I could think of was to take him back to Cooley Dickinson Hospital um, where we checked in and, and spent most of the night there and then somebody from ServiceNet shows up um, and uh, is very helpful and uh, says, you know, I think you should, we should check him into the respite house. So he checked into the uh, respite house in Northampton, and that was the first kind of stability that, that, you know, came into Chris's life, is the service net respite house. And it really was that, you know, it was a respite from, from, from chaos, basically. In 1975, as a result of a consent decree, patients in the state hospital were 
um, entitled to treatment in what they call least restrictive settings. So if someone did not need to be in a secure facility like a hospital, they did in fact have a right, um, as mandated by the federal court, to live in uh, a group home or uh, on their own in the community with a range of services. That was a, a big change from a confined situation into something far less confining. We provide for those who need it, 24-hour residential programs where we would have a staff member available around the clock. We, from an office, go and see them in their own place and provide whatever level of service they need, which for the individuals can, can vary, to being seen once, two, three times a day to check in with them, to bring them their medications, uh, to ensure that they're getting to their appointments, to help them uh, get to their daily activity, whether it's employment or a volunteer job or um, a day program. It's been really good. This is a good place to be. I feel good about being here. We settled into this place and it's our home. And yeah, yeah, it's a great little place. Oh, you do a good job of keeping the place super. I can't imagine what it would be like living with a roommate that was messy because she's so clean. It's wonderful. Each residence is a little different. Some have only men, some have men and women, some have younger people. So there's a different feeling to the residences. But I think they all share the same common um, kind of familial and community sense that we try to develop so that people uh, feel uh, respected and supported in those areas where they need support. I like the house. I like the layout. Um, the staff works very hard at keeping it clean. Uh, my, my room is great, spacious, well furnished. There still are state hospitals, but uh, you know the vast majority uh, uh, are not there anymore are in settings like this. It certainly works here. It certainly works here. I mean, I think you can see this is a nice house. It's a nice place to live. Monday through Friday, I go to Starlight Center with a group of people from the house here in Florence. And we spend the morning there. I'm their volunteer receptionist. I work at DMH and I'm a janitor. Actually, I'm supposed to be called a housekeeper. <laughs> we go to the library at Smith for at least once every two days. Um, I go on the computer. Mondays I have one-to-one -one therapy at one o'clock, so that kind of structures my day around that. Um, on Thursdays I meet with my student, I'm a volunteer tutor, um, with a Brazilian woman teaching her English. It's a great responsibility and um, something I take seriously. I am involved with NAMI, doing some volunteer work, work with them in their Western Mass office. They need some work done with the library. I love to listen to music. I just got a new CD. <laughs> I've listened to it at least ten times since I picked it up on Friday afternoon. This is Maryland's annual ISP review. I wanted to um, overview a couple areas. I wanted to overview the mental health area, as we always do. I have down four areas that we work with Maryland on um, vocationally, um, ADL tasks, socially, and medically. Each uh, individual who we provide care for or service to has a plan, a program spe specific treatment plan that we that they help us write. It's a plan that identifies the goals and objectives for their living within this pr program. And ideally, those plans are, are like a road map for each of the clients that we serve in looking ahead at what it is that they're working on. I used to be afraid of taking showers. I would take showers but feel miserable doing it. And therapy has helped me become less fearful of showers. That's just a small thing, but 
well, it probably sounds like a small thing to you, but for me, it's a big thing. Being able to shower without fear. Yeah, we come from similar mental health experiences, the two of us. Just uh, struggling with mental illness and getting on the right medication is so important. When I went to Bridgewater State Hospital, they put me on antipsychotic medication immediately, and it brought me out of the delusions within two weeks. It was amazing. So I had gone seven, seven or eight years of unnecessary suffering, and as soon as I was put on medication, my delusions cleared up. I do a lot of work in trying to educate uh, the patients that I see about why I'm prescribing a medicine in the first place. Dr. Kraft is one in a million. He's my psychiatrist who prescribes my medication. He works with the patient. He doesn't impose his will on us. He listens to what we have to say. When I've been well and on the medication for a long period of time, I have a tendency to want to stop the medication. And so it's very important that I have the memory of how the medication helped me when I was at Bridgewater State Hospital. With any client, they always have the right to refuse meds. So if, if a client were, if I were to go and um, deliver meds to a client, I would ask them, and they said, you know, I, I'm not going to take that today. I would explain, you know, the benefits of taking those meds. And also, you know, if, if they're not to take those meds, what kind of things could happen? It's possible right now that if I went off of the medication, I wouldn't immediately start having symptoms. But eventually, I probably would. With successful therapy, whether it be behavior, uh, th cognitive behavioral therapy, on the one hand, a talking form of therapy, or medication therapy, it works on the same center of the brain. That to me is exciting because it, it means, from what, what I take from it, it means that some we can do through talking certain changes that are reflected in biochemical changes in the brain. I have no problem with that. In fact, that's the way I think the, the brain works. But at the same time, the medication can change it too. Or with some people, the medication may change enough of it so then the talking therapy can really help that person build up different patterns that will compete with the pattern where the, that makes them feel so stuck. Dialectical behavior therapy is an um, outpatient program and it involves an individual therapy session once a week along with a skills class that takes place once a week. Certain skills from DBT such as distress tolerance are very concrete hands-on skills that I think really can be helpful to both staff and the residents. So it might not be that huge problems can be solved um, in what's going on in someone's life, for example, if they're looking for a job. But there, there might be small steps that they can be taking to tolerate the stress of these larger goals. One of the programs we have uh, for our clients is our Fit Together program. That program is designed to match clients with a personal trainer or a volunteer who would then help them become more active. I bike with my partner two times a week. We have a great time. Each time we go a little further, we have a good time. And when I ask him, how are you feeling? He says, well, much better than before I left. And I feel the same way. We bike, but other people can do yoga, go walking, go to dance class, do karate, uh, whatever it is that they choose to explore and experiment with. So the volunteers and the recipients who are clients of ServiceNet both really benefit from it and have a great time. Who knows? what would come of that, where we have a client who's sitting at home, perhaps watching, probably watching more TV than they need to, need to be, depending a great deal on cigarettes and coffee for the sort of their own pleasure, 
when in fact they could have a relationship with another person to get them out of the house. We also get together monthly for gatherings to celebrate everyone's achievements. And even if that means that someone has walked 100 yards the first time, but they've never done walking before, that's going to be celebrated. A peer specialist um, is a person who was on staff who identified as being a person recovered from mental illness, having received treatment from mental illness and is now working with us and creating um, groups and artistic experiences and music. And we want to build on that so other people can follow in that track. Who better to do the job than someone with experience? Um, I look up to people who have taken on challenges that are similar to mine and overcome them and shown that you don't have to feel great every day. You need to maintain and focus and be present on the job. I have a lot of things going on. I've got an art group that I run and we use that as an opportunity to explore our experience in life, to communicate things maybe without words that usually we do use words to describe but are hard. I also have facilitated a, a music group which has become a band unto itself called The Endless and we've performed at mental health awareness fairs and like the art group it's a place to express ourselves. We're creating a new model and more and more folks are getting on board with it and I think it's really helping to transform the system that we work in. There's a group of individuals and I'll use the age range of 18 to 24, who, who have fallen through the cracks in some ways, who, who are caught between systems sometimes, between what we would refer to as child services or child, yes, child services and or, and the adult services, who, who are struggling many times with all the things that that age group struggles with. Identity, the future, where do I fit in, you know, uh, self-image, all those kinds of things, and are also struggling with something more serious, which is mental illness. So we've pulled these four young adults together to live in this townhouse, and so we have a young adult, young, young uh, woman who's come from a, another young adult program who's from this area. We have a young man who is living with a foster family who's joined this group of young adults. We have a young man who is homeless and who needed a place to live. And we have another young adult who was from another area who needed to come in and um, to have a stable living environment. Going really well. We have um, three residents employed right now and our fourth resident is working on that. At night they all cook dinner together yeah. and sit and eat together and it's a real family atmosphere. I decided when I moved here that I'm going to start my life over. So within starting my life over, can you see this? These are three of the people I look up to here, and there's one more who is in this. Um, this is JP, Patrick, and Caroline. I had a staff member remark to me the other day that he was so excited about the young adult program because it represented a change for these young people with mental illness in a way that these older adults never had because we did institutionalize them, we did hospitalize them, and many of them were there for, for decades. Do you know what Lois did for me? She is the most wonderful person. She got in touch with her supervisor at ServiceNet and arranged to go with me to Indiana to see my mother. I felt that should Marilyn ever have any kind of peace or resolution that if her parents were aging and it would be really important for her to, to meet with, with them. Can you believe that? Lois did that for me. She got me back in touch with my mother. Uh, the t telephone conversations increased and uh, and at, at some point I, re I suggested to the family that we come and visit. And at first it was, they said no, absolutely not. And um, after maybe a couple of months, right, um, they said, um, 
if, if, if I would come with her, that she could come. And we stayed in a Holiday Inn in my hometown. And I was reunited with my mother under Lois's watchful eye. I thought it was a, a turning point at some point for, for Marilyn to not resolve all the issues of her past, but at least some, some closure. My mother died five years ago. That's the only time that I saw my mother in the past 20 or 25 years. It was amazing, it, and I felt it was probably one of the most important things I've done in, in my time here is to, to reconnect Marilyn with her, her family. And now I go back every year. Alone. I burned down a mental health building for which I was sentenced to 8 to 12 years in state prison. They refer to him as a high-profile client because, because he committed a crime while he was psychotic that could have potentially harmed people. The time that I was sentenced to, I would have had to serve 6 years, 11 months, which I did. Then I went to Bridgewater State Hospital um, because I was actively mental, uh, mentally ill at the, at the time. I was delusionary. I believed that I was in charge of Earth, and I had a whole delusional system built around that. The whole time I was in prison, I was mentally ill, and I was untreated. I was unmedicated. And it's kind of a minor scandal in our country that the mentally ill in prison are, are not being treated. Eventually they discharged me to Parkview Specialty Hospital in Springfield. And I was at Parkview for a year and three months. And then I came here. His um, transition into the community um, was extremely planned. Uh, DMH had been involved for quite a long time. Then I came on board about six months prior to his discharge. And eventually, at his pace, he was able to come out into the residence at a, at a time that felt comfortable for him. This is a man who I imagine will get full-time competitive employment, um, be employable, live independently, or maybe even a shared apartment with somebody, with one other person. <laughs> The attitude in, in our family is uh, 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 not to admit that there are any mental health issues or problems, uh, even though they are all throughout the family. Uh, and it's baffling because, you know, Chris, Chris presents very well. Chris um, is well-spoken and intelligent. When you, when you meet him, you wouldn't think that, that these problems exist. Um, but they do, and they're very, very real. The condition he was in when Harry and I picked him up was, it was, it was terrifying. Um, so what I've learned is that every family in the world has the potential for this to happen within the family and none of us know what resources are available. It doesn't matter how well educated we are. Part of it is generational. My parents' generation typically didn't feel comfortable admitting um, about a mental illness. That's what uh, Chris has suffered from, I've suffered from it. Um, my other brothers, one of whom uh, died of uh, complications from manic depression, uh, suffered from it. But I, I, I feel like this generation is, you know, finally confronting these problems. <laughs> People with mental illness are human beings with goals and aspirations and feelings and it really is very unfortunate that people are prejudiced against them and single them out and look down on them. Um, 
prejudice is kind of a strong word, but I, I think it's accurate. There is a prejudice against the mentally ill. I know there's a lot of misconceptions about um, clients, that all clients that are mentally ill, um, you know, that many clients have histories of violence, which is not, not by any means, not, not the case. Some do, yes. Um, but I think mentally ill folks are, are like, like all of us. They, they struggle daily. Um, they have a lot more, more obstacles to overcome in their background. Um, there are a lot of things that um, prevent them from doing more, um, not because they're lazy. I think that's another misconception, is all mentally ill people are lazy, and I don't believe that for a minute. Um, I think there's a lot of education out there that needs to happen. Um, there's a lot of fears, and people are often unwilling to to recognize that they have a fear about what they don't understand. We opened a, a group home in Williamsburg recently, and we bought the house, and it came to the attention of people, uh, I guess through the seller, I can't remember exactly how the information became known, but um, the community did find out that ServiceNet was buying a home, and I received phone calls saying, who's going in there? And I had to politely say, I can't really talk about who's going in there. Um, and I talked with uh, the town officials there, and we all decided that it would be a good idea to have a meeting, a community meeting, not to discuss the details of the clients, but to give information about who ServiceNet was, and to give them um, an idea of the kinds of work we did, and to try to reassure them about um, the fact that we're a responsible agency, that we're not going to um, have people in a home that don't have the proper supervision um, tailored to their needs and that kind of thing. And there was one person who was going to be moving into that group home who um, was amenable to the idea of his parents coming to the community meeting and talking with the community members about uh, the group home and about him. I think that was a very effective kind of communication because again that's a real family. It's understandable people feel threatened and they feel worried and they feel um, concerned and, and um, don't want it to be in their neighborhood and even very progressive people who do believe in deinstitutionalization and would never want to lock people up in a hospital for the rest of their lives um, when it comes down to them being next door it's sort of the NIMBY phenomenon that surfaces. Almost 100% of the time when um, a community, a neighborhood, finds out that a group home for people with almost any disability uh, is going to be moving into their neighborhood, they don't want it. Uh, more often than not, the major symptoms or problems in these diagnostic groups are that the clients themselves are afraid of the people in the community, not the reverse. Ideally, I would like to live in, in a house with with uh, roommates, housemates. You know, maybe two or three other housemates that that I share things in common with. Uh, I think that would be better for me than living by myself. It, if I live by myself, the symptoms of my mental illness could get the the better of me once again. I'm applying for some jobs with the Department of Environmental Conservation for the state of Massachusetts. It would be the, the first time that I will have had a regular job in five years. In the future, I'm looking, I'm in actively looking for a job. Um, it's going slow right now. Um, part of the problem is I'm an ex-convict with a mental health history and so many employers are not going to be interested in me um, with a history like that. But uh, I continued to look and eventually I have some money. Uh, my father passed away a number of years ago and he left me some money. Eventually, I would like to get my master's degree. I, I have my bachelor's and possibly in criminology become a criminologist because I want to have some place to work where my prison time is not a detriment, where it's, a, where it's an asset. 
and criminology would be a natural place for that. Almost everyone that we've um, encountered that have mental illnesses have um, the capacity to improve significantly and have a more satisfying life. I guess the thing I would say is to try to use the resources that are available. There are tremendous resources. ServiceNet is a very large organization and they have a lot of resources to share. What I'm most proud of is that um, our approach more and more, and uh, it's, it's an evolution, but um, it's more and more oriented towards re people's recovery. I know that ServiceNet and Valley Programs and other names it's had before that have been a driving force of good mental health care here for a very, very long time. We are all working for the good of the patient, and it's a marvelous thing to watch four or five individual people from different backgrounds trying to help one person get through his or her life. For me, that's what it is, quality of life and helping people find things, joy, in just living. I've been here for the last seven years, and you've done some really good work, really hard work, and we're all very proud of you for where you are in your life right now, and we wanted to give you the certificate. Everybody, let me see. Certificate of achievement, great. Can't believe I'm at the, this point to move on with my life and, and, and show other people that you can make a life. It, it's been a really, a lot of good years here and a lot of good staff that uh, pushed me to reach my potential in life. I miss all of you. You've been really great to me, and I, I won't forget you. I think if you met any of these people that we work with, I mean, you'd, you'd really see some wonderful human beings. That's what they are, with mental illness. I ask myself, who's this perfect creature? I ask myself, who's this lovely lad? It's the man in the mirror, and he's coming after me. So watch our boy and stay awake I told her I didn't want no people I told her I didn't want no friends I told her that I'm heading for the gallows I told her that I'm waiting for an end I told her that my mind is turning backwards I told her that my world is turning black But why must a Regan get caught in this mess? Oh no, my legs are turning back I ask myself, who's this perfect creature? I ask myself, who's this lovely lad? It's the man in the mirror and he's coming after me So watch out, boy, and stay awake I needed one room to do my business I needed colors, rainbows, and a glass I scratched my face upon the broken mirror I needed time to think about the past I shadowed at the cafe and drank water I wrote another poem, do you mind? I don't understand it, but hey who will? And now it's time for the tape to rewind. I ask myself, who's this perfect creature? I ask myself, who's this lovely lad? It's the man in the mirror and he's coming after me. So watch out, boy, and stay awake. So watch out, boy, and stay awake. So watch out, boy, and stay awake. Hey. <laughs> I was looking forward to answering that question. Yeah.